Hi everybody, Chrissy from Voice Jesus here, and I just enjoyed some pizza with Pat Cressida at the Mulberry Street Pizzeria. It was so good. Uh, and now we both have garlic bread, but you know, at least we both have garlic bread, you can't like it. So, anyway, you know Pat probably already. She was Dee Dee in, uh, in Dexter's Laboratory. In the Disney parks, she's been in Tower of Terror, Haunted Mansion is at Wisconsin Hatchaway. So many video games, so many promos and trailers, and, and really uh, awesome at voice matching and the ADR and looping, which we're going to talk about. But I just wanted to start by talking about social media because you're probably one of the most active people on social media that I know, and I love watching your, your tweets and your, your Facebook posts because uh, for me, I'm a big voiceover fan, of course, but also a big Disney fan. So the stuff you've been posting, just Thank Disney you. history and historical, the historical stuff, is so interesting to me. Uh, and I just need it all up. So thank you. And so if you aren't following Cal already, I think you're at Cressida on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Right? Yeah, all, all three. And it's funny that you say that, though, because I'm really not the most active social media person by a stretch in yeah. the entertainment industry. Yeah. But, um, but I think. It's Voiceover because of my passion for video. I don't have a very active. Yeah, well, like from a content standpoint, I think the stuff you're posting is wonderful. So Thank you. make sure you follow Kat if you weren't already. Um, so let's talk about Disney since we already started there. Okay. But I know, so I know that's your background, and your dad was actually an Imagineer in the park. And I want to talk about your childhood growing up in that environment and going to the park, of course. And, the stuff your dad taught you as like as you're looking at the park, like does he did he talk about why they use certain colors or certain shapes or stuff like that and uh, what you hear like so yeah, did you learn sure. from that? Yeah. So just just for clarification because it's very really important. Yeah. The authenticity. Please. My dad wasn't technically an Imagineer. He was. Uh, he worked with the Imagineers. Okay. He was a freelance uh, graphic designer and worked in marketing and advertising. Oh, cool. That was okay. So yeah, absolutely. So during the late uh, late 60s, early 70s, he was uh, very close to a lot of folks. It, it was when WDI, yep. those who know the Disney yes. industry, and then it became WDI, which stands for Walt Disney Imagineering. And um, he, it was a very different culture back then. Disney was, for once, it was, I'm, I'm a complete Disney ho. I'm all about the brand and all about Disney and very, very blessed to do a lot with it. But truthfully, for those who know, the culture and the brand was going through a bit of a low point during the yes. uh, late the 60s, guy. early 70s. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was trying to find its way. And then, um, I, I was like, five or six during the mid-70s when all this was going on. And my dad would bring me down to take me out of school or bring me down over the weekends when he had meetings down there. Yeah. So he would literally um, drive down, we'd pull into the giant parking lot out of uh, uh, Harbor and we would um, park in what now is can't park there now, it's completely security dock, but um, there were this two-story, very 1960s building that was back there that used to be called Mickey Mouse University, but now it's not in that. And he would have meetings there, but first he would walk me into the park, sit me down on a park bench on Main Street, uh, set me up with like some popcorn and soda, and some coloring books, and they would say, stay. I'm going to go to some meetings outside the oh, wow. And I'm sure I'm convinced he must have gone to some shopkeepers on me and he said, you know, keep an eye on her. <laughs> but I thought I had complete autonomy as a, as a child. And interestingly enough, I would stay with him and I would um, learn a lot. Yeah. His, he would give me some credo, like, write in your little journal and tell me what you hear, tell me what you smell, tell me what you see. Uh, I, want, I want a full report when I come back, cool. as if I were like the on-the-spot reporter. It's like a cloud, like a cloud. It's a little cloud. Yeah. But, um, but I learned a lot, and uh, we would walk up and down Main Street, and he would point out all of the ADR, the loops, the voiceover that were going yeah. on, that still most people uh, don't know is planted there. And we would listen to the old, um, uh, the corner store, the coffee corner store where you can buy lemonade and dill pickles, hot cider, and you know the old fashioned yes. Yeah, so we would listen to those, and that was those are my early memories of really getting what voiceover was. was okay, listening to those old fashioned gramophones, yeah, and yeah, hearing the loops and the character voices on it, and um, and then going 
going on the attractions and my dad's going that as well. So. Yeah. Cool. And so did that did that give you kind of a uh, was that kind of the basis for your love of storytelling and stuff, or was it even before any of that? Like, what you're growing up? Uh, I'm sure. I mean, I think I didn't. Like, you know, when you're a tot, you don't you don't file things underneath categories. Sure. You sort of know that you love them or what you're drawn to. I do remember playing very special that he was letting me in on a behind the scenes peek at how body and animatronics were running. Yeah. And, you know, that's a joke I've made on a bunch of Disney podcasts yeah. that, you know, most little, most parents with their little kids are like, look, there's Mickey Mouse. And, right. you know, you want to take a picture of Mickey Mouse? And my yeah. dad would be like, look, there's an automatronic bird, and this is how it works, oh, and this is what, so how, what makes the sound. Yeah. And it didn't destroy any of the. I do know the word, by the way, it's audio animatronic, but I'm so excited that it all kind of became one as much. Um, I, it didn't disenchant it at all for me. I remember going on the, into the tiki room, and this is back when it was the longer room now, of course, they've completely trumped yes. this show, but he was explaining to me exactly that there was a giant room of machines that were literally, you know, real to real, yep. acetate, tape, yeah. and, um, what was making the flowers do what they were doing, the birds do what they were doing, that was this was Walt's first experiment with audio animatronics, yeah. and it was the first attraction to use them. And then we talk about the World's Fair, the 6465 Fair, and how it kept dysfunctioning. functioning. It, it never felt like it was breaking the math. It always felt still really special. It's even more intriguing. You know, it's interesting how it works, right? Yeah. And I, I didn't know that I was, to answer your question, I didn't know that I was going to I never thought in the years I'd be so lucky to be a part of the experience the way that I became a part of it. But I did feel like I had to one day be a part of this. And I didn't know if that meant I was going to become an Imagineer. Yeah. Or to a little kid, you see the parks, you think, I want to work the parks. That's what I went bombed on to, and that's what I ended up fighting tooth and nail to do in my teens. Yeah. But um, I, didn't, I didn't make the connection between the parks voiceover per se until all later in my whole evolution and then you're, I know that you worked in the park for a while, in a little while. What was the first job that you, you had in the park? And I really only had one. Okay. I, mean, I worked there for a couple of seasons. Just, uh, I was what's called a seasonal cast member. Uh, and I was very, very unique. Most people who worked in, in Disneyland as a cast member lived in Orange County. Anaheim, you know, LA being what it is with the traffic and cars and all that. Um, LA proper, for those of you who don't know, is an hour and a half, two hours north of Orange County. So that's two hour, that's four hours of drive time total, plus your time at the park. And that's why my parents were so cold doing it. But um, so yeah, I did it summer. So you were back in the drive back in the Sometimes I would crash at a relative's down in the OC, but yeah. yeah, I mean, the hour and a half. I mean, the wee hours of the morning, which was my favorite time to be on the five freeway because there's no one else on yeah. the road, you can make it easily in about 15 minutes. Um, let's see. But, um, but yeah, in normal time, it's two hours. And what job did you have as a cast member? Uh, oh, I was, a, I was a narrator, storyteller, sort of a band. Traffic operator. I know. Yeah. Microphone. And you already knew all the stories. I mean, yeah, you knew all the stories, and so yeah. I'm sure you could. You were great at that. Oh that my job, God! They, right? I was. I would not have wanted to. I was convinced I was the only person who could do it. I'm sure. And uh, we had to memorize this field you know, before we could actually go out on the field. We also had to learn boat operations, which I was good at. Good at. Okay. Um, and that this was. I mean, what I really wanted to do. I remember going through orientation. And yeah. There was another. There was one other person from my school, once you see her play, go Bears. There's one other person from my school named Scott, and we were waiting for our assignments and we were in orientation. We knew that we made it into um, attractions operations, which is what everybody sort of wanted to be in, unless you wanted to be a princess or you know, those things, but I, I knew I didn't want to be in parades or anything. And so we knew we made it that far. I wanted Jungle Book. I wanted Jungle Book so Badly. And back in the day, don't want to date myself, but uh, Jungle Cruise. Or Jungle Book. What did I say? Jungle Book. 
I figured I knew what you're talking about. Like there was a joke about that side of water. That side of water. I wanted that so bad, yeah. and girls weren't allowed. Oh wow! This was they were very clear. It was very chauvinistic still back then. This was in the. Uh, Nineties, early to mid nineties. Oh, okay. so um, even in the nineties. Wow, I didn't know it was that. Oh yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Gals did not work dating um, Dan Crockett's news. They didn't work anything that required any sort of like he man maneuverability <laughs> um, and just you know shooting guns. So it was, those were the guys. The girls could be the cute little cheerleaders. I'm sorry, but glam girl with skirts. Cheerleaders. So. Yeah, I had to do all to go and just. I would have killed it on Gentleman's Cruise, though, man. Are you kidding me? Yeah. I would have that. And there was one night where we were allowed to flip flop. Yeah. Like it was a topsy turvy, oh, cool. it goes kind of a. And you could, you could sign up for what attraction you really wanted to be on. And I did get onto it, but I got sick of that night. So oh. I never, never, never got to do it? This is my life dream that, like, one day, maybe, when I'm really old. <laughs> Someone will say, let's give a shout out to Kat Cressida for her contributions to the brand. She's going to come up and do My that. bucket list would be <laughs> to be on the Jungle Street. That's awesome. I could kill it, man. I love that. Video. So then you went from that to now, and now you're doing work in the park. And how is that, how is that feel? And, and going to the park, you're, you're, was Tower Terror the first attraction that you um, no, the very first attraction that I voiced, well, there were a few of them. Um, so, uh, the very first one was for an attraction that's in Hong Kong, or Disney Sea, I don't know. Disney Sea, Tokyo? Okay. It's Hong Kong. Okay. I don't know, it was like an Arabian Nights meets Pirates of the Caribbean. Oh, cool. And that's why it was sort of like Arabian Nights. But when they described it to us, they said it's kind of like a ride to kind of like pirates. And yeah. I, I'm just doing Walla. I'm doing like a little okay, background, like you hear on pirates, background conversation going on. You pick up a smidge here or pick up a smidge. That was the first thing I got to do. And that was really exciting. That was with a, a small core group. I think I was the only female and the rest were males. Okay. Maybe there's another female. But I remember that um, that James Taylor yeah, was, James that, yeah, yeah. was in that group too. And it was... He was like, he'd been, do, he'd been doing the all of her with them, and he was really excited because like he wanted to cross over into voiceover proper. Yeah. He was coming from radio. Yeah, yeah. And um, I was just barely, barely had broken into it too, so he was, he was great. Okay. And then something I did was hugely exciting. I did, um, and they were all, or maybe not, because it, it's very forgettable, but they tore down, they took down Lincoln, yes. and they had this brilliant idea to make it as a wall sound. Yes. With the weird head, yes, with the 3D head oh, cameras, yes. which they don't have anymore. But for the two years that they had that, um, I was part of the loop group that did the binaural Oh, wow. Sound and the most exciting part of that was I was standing next to Keith Oh wow! And when the casting director said, "Cat, this is Keith. This is Cat. Cat, this is Brenda." And I, I freaked out. Not just a real legend, but also Disney legend. I mean, yeah. I mean, he's, yeah. He's hungry. I'm not thirty million other things. Yeah. Yeah. And I lost my. <laughs> so excited! Wow, I was standing next to Henry, uh, I was in awe. So that was that was the second thing, and then I think the third thing was scratching on Tower of Terror. Okay, and it was just a scratch. Oh, were, you were just scr scratching. Yeah, oh, and that's, oh, okay. that's what I went in so that they would have something to uh, play with or think about. And um, but I was told that maybe uh, maybe a month later that they liked it so much that they just. So oh, wow. Know. They got the scratch mark for the girl in the, in the elevator? Yeah, we, we, we did. No, she's not in the elevator. Oh, she's the little girl lost in the fourth dimension. Oh, oh, oh. So if if you're a classic Twilight Zone oh, fan, there's oh fewer and fewer of those folks out there who actually know this oh. reference, but it's the famous episode. There's a, um, the little girl disappears into the fourth dimension, mm -hmm. and fortunately the parents are friends with some physicist, astrophysicist professor who draws yeah. a quickly handily drives a chalk circle on the wall and basically says, see, here's how you get into the, the portal. Yeah, and he puts his hand through <laughs> it. 
But it, it, that concept, that episode was the um, origins of Poltergeist. The oh, storyline of the little girl, which is very interesting. Okay. Yeah, so. And she sounds a lot like the little girl from Poltergeist. So that, that's what I did for that. And that went into. Um, uh, first, it was just in the, the new one out in California Adventure. Yep. Then they put it into. One of Hong Kong, I think. Okay. One of the Asian parks. Okay. Has Tower of Terror, and I'm in that one, and then eventually it ended up. Is it? Well. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, that was that was the third one, and then the fourth one, I probably not even supposed to talk about because it got it got torn out very quickly. Oh. But I was the lead voice. This is very exciting for me. I was the lead voice in our attraction that no one will remember uh, at Disney California Adventure when it first opened, called. Superstar Limo. Oh, I remember hearing about yeah. Oh, and it was um, it was in the Hollywood part of you know, Hollywood Boulevard, yeah. and it was basically um, it's like Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, but in a limousine yeah. driven by a ditzy chauffeur. And that was you. And I'm narrating you through the sights of Hollywood and pointing out who the celebrities are, and the idea that it, it was going to get updated every six months with spottings of new celebrities. Huh. At the time, Melanie Griffith and Anton and there was Were the celebrities? So, well, there was a bunch of them, but I remember that was like, we had to keep rewriting that line. Interesting. And from what I understand, that attraction lasted about six months. Um, <laughs> but that was some of my first experience sort of really big too. Really, that was exciting. Okay. And um, and that was pure Valley Girl playlist. I'm like, ah, so cool. And then um, and then the and then mansion process for mansion. And when you went in for mansion, I mean, was that a, was that a audition? And, and what did they tell you? What what did, I mean? What, what you went in to read for? What did they tell you that you were reading for? I assume it was. Mostly that I mean, the truthfully, that was a standard audition where, uh, and it, it was to be the old character. But oh, they weren't telling us even the physical part. Yeah, physical. Part. But they didn't tell us anything. So it was dressed very clean, very pure, minimal makeup, hair swept away. Um, I remember the casting director saying, "I can't tell you anything about it, but you may figure it out." The lines, which is odd because actually, you know, the, the lines were literally just wedding vows, and that didn't tell you anything. Sure. <laughs> that didn't give anything away to me necessarily. Um, but I was told think, think classic Disneyland, and um, that's all. That's all we were doing. Okay. And then we, we got brought back into. We're all sort of I'm sitting with a bunch of gals, and most of the gals were younger than me. They were in their early twenties, and. Very sort of Barbie looking. Hmm. So I was like, all right, I'm already the dark horse here. Because I'm not exactly you know, all American Barbie doll. And, and then we got brought back, and there was a table with some props, a bouquet of flowers, and, and a, just a stick. I guess it was the same thing yeah, but, And it was just stand here and deliver the wedding vows, but when you get to the end of each vow, do a twist. Okay. Um, and again, with no context, so I was like, "Yeah, how do you do?" All right. Okay. Uh, they were like, kind of, kind of eerie, kind of, you know, enjoy what you're saying, but enjoy the twist at the end and make it kind of dark. And so I just sort of went with that, and it's like, well, they know what they're doing, so I'll just do it. But it was also sort of awkward because they wanted, <laughs> they kept wanting us to do something with the prop, uh huh, but not move too much and. You know, now in retrospect, yeah. knowing what it was supposed to be, now I understand. But at the time, it was sort of like, we'll here, hold this stick. Yeah. And when you get to the end of the line, kind of, you know, do something with it, but don't move too much. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And as it turns out, after that first round, uh, that's when they made the decision, you know what, we need to split this up. And the voice is such an important element of it. Um, rather than casting, you know, so of course, they, they needed has the bride based on its character. Yeah. The portrait oh, yeah. she's supposed to be the imaginary credo for her was that she was literally the face that any man would fall in love with. You could understand why 
dozens of men would just keep marrying this chick, uh -huh. knowing that husbands had mysteriously disappeared. Or, right. You know, it was, was pre-internet, but still, you, you think where we get around. Uh, so, um, yeah, she was supposed to be like the loveliest, most appealing woman in the world that any man would fall for. And then they they wanted the voice to be the same thing. Um, and then they were start, I guess, thinking it through, going, okay, well, you're being her the voice when you first enter the attic, and it's going to be the most prevalent. You're going to hear it before you see it, and it's going to be what really defines the character. So at that point, I think they made the decision to split up. Okay, we'll hire one person for the face, um, one person for the, the voice. Okay. And there were at least two other callbacks. And every callback, they would reveal a little bit more, but it's Imagineering, so you sign an NDA, and they don't tell you really anything. Okay. And I think it was the final callback I finally got told. You figured, oh, um, okay. It's for a, an update for the Haunted Mansion, and I... What was the reaction when you well, found out? Well, almost, I almost wish that I didn't know because oh. the hoe that I am, the idea of, I mean, what are the odds? Updating the vibe. Yeah. What are the odds that a classic attraction yeah. that I grew up in that inspired me to go into voiceover that I'm going to end up a voiceover? Because those rides were done in 1969, 67, 68, 69. All those voices in the mansion were uh -huh. the same. And, you know, now we're in like 2006, and um, so at least 15 years later, what are the chances they're going to be able to update this? And, and, and a lead voice, but like a main, a main voice, and not just like, I would have said, said, top of a you know, or like some safety spiel or something. So, um, it was surreal. We had, the pressure that I put on myself, and I, I know I didn't sleep at all the night before. I know I was on the internet researching every bit about the mansion that I could, because the credo kept being, it's really important to us that the voice sound like um, it had always been there. Like, don't want it to have this jarring sensation of new technology, new character. It was supposed to feel seamless, like it's, it's always been there. Maybe just didn't happen to notice it, or maybe took yeah. a different turn. But they didn't. They wanted it to feel classic, yeah. uh, WDI, and and then the voice print. I was working very hard to sort of match somewhat, not match, but bring in elements of Leota, yeah. little Leota in particular. Um, and they kept saying they wanted both classic, but also contemporary. Yeah. It had to be appealing to modern life. Well, who better to fill that hole though? Just being the fan that you are and knowing that ride that attraction so well. I mean, you're, you're sweet, like, but I mean, there's a lot of people that seriously though. Look, I mean, I mean, you, I, you already understand the, the, the soul of that ride and, and, and the history behind the ride. So I mean, yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. Just to be yeah. a fan. Yeah, <laughs> more people though. You know. so. uh, I could do no, the voice. I, I understand lucky. the history, right? So no, I got, I got so, very, very lucky. And the irony, the secret that. The haven't ever shared on any podcast. Okay. Is I I've had nightmares my entire life of being trapped in a haunted mansion. Really? Were you afraid to ride as a child? Or? Yes. Oh really? Oh uh, yeah. My dad had to lie to me. He <laughs> called it the magic castle, and I got lied to. Okay. And I screamed bloody murder when I got brought into it. Oh. Um, he he made me continue through it. But uh, at one point, you know, probably these days that would be called that. But <laughs> he, he knew. I mean, he knew that once he got me into it, you know, sure enough, once we kind of got into the seance room, I completely settled down and was enchanted. But the very first part, especially with the coffin, yeah. the Edgar Allan Poe, I mean, still to this day. And I, and I do still indicate it. Really have to say so, I was going to say, does it still affect you now? Yeah, but it's not, it's not like it's not like the Disney Haunted Mansion. Yeah. It's like, you know how in a dream, it's like, you know it's the Disney Haunted Mansion, but it's much scarier. It's very interesting. Oh, yeah. So, um, let's talk a little about voice matching and kind of stay in that, that genre. But I know that you do so much voice matching and probably one of the, the biggest voice matching, especially female, uh, doing voice matching in the industry. Can you talk a little about, I know Jesse, the same character, Jesse from Toy Story is one that you do. What other um, characters are you doing voice matching? Are you a celebrity or not?
I'm, I'm lucky to do so much of it for, for various reasons. So of course Disney has a really important one of their ancillary products for yep. the original celebrity created <laughs> um, and I know there's a lot of music various voice matches for them, including Jesse. But there's there's such a need for it in other parts of the industry, which I know we're talking a little bit about. Um, yeah. Yes. And uh, for a lot of the trailer houses that create the, the awesome trailers that you see on TV and yeah. the ERC that you excited about. Them. Yeah. And it's, it's really nuts how much it's needed and how much it's used on a day to day. And I, I did some for, um, uh, what's that show? Last week tonight on John Oliver. Oh, yeah. You know, where they're making fun of some stuff. Right sure. They did it. I've done it for the Tonight Show. Or for, you know, so, for for trailers, how does that? What are you are you replacing the original line from the film because they don't want people to know what the movie is about, or what's the reasoning for any other trailers? Yeah, it can be for all kinds of reasons. So again, this is getting into a very specific yeah. part of the industry, and I don't want to bore your no, no, this is audience. But um, when they're when a top trailer ha when a trailer house is shaping the campaign, or, so let's take. Uh, What's going to be around in a month? People still care about the, the Huntsman? Sure. Or Star Wars? Star Wars, Star Wars yeah. Okay. So when they're shaping the campaign, first of all, as probably most of us have recognized, there's different campaigns aimed at different demographics. And there's going to be the big, giant campaign that we're all going to see in the theaters. Um, and there'll be one or two versions of that as it gets closer to the actual. So, and then there'll be TV campaigns going yes. on, but there'll be different TV campaigns depending on what channels, and they'll specifically have a, a very keyed in campaign targeted at specific demographics. So, Disney being as savvy as they are, for example, would have created several different Star Wars campaigns, some aimed at the adults who still were in love with and remember fondly the original trilogy. That there's, we're okay, we're aiming at the next generation now, the ones that need action and adventure and aren't necessarily tied to the original characters, yeah. but love the idea. Then of course there's a whole demographic from Disney, from the, from the yep. animated yep. and animated series. And Wars, all that. Yep. Yep. So that's, they're making sure that they're aiming campaigns in different demographics. So, therefore, um, they're going to tell different stories. Trailers are going to unwind a different aspect of the story and key into different aspects of the characters. Which character they focus on, what storyline they focus on. And you know how, I mean, I'm the worst offender of this, where you go to see the movie, and maybe you've been watching the trailer and getting excited about it, and then you go see the movie and you're like, those lines weren't even in the movie. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. yes. Um, so sometimes they either use deleted scenes that yeah. never made it. That's what I was, I always thought it was a deleted scene that they cut and they just Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But th even even still, if, if it's a deleted scene, you probably didn't go to final post. And a lot of times, as you know, when they shoot a movie, on, especially on location, they don't pick up the sound for break. So they'll have the celebrities come back. Well, for a trailer, they won't necessarily have the $25,000 to bring in. Tom Cruise for places all So they'll in a great signature. We are for the actual movie, but for the trailer too. Like, is that the trailer? Would you like to do with the celebrity or Like, so I'll go in and I'll actually do replace the lines from the movie specifically for the trailer. And then would, for, would that also? Um, translate into the final film? No, or that's, oh. that's the loop group. That's a whole. Oh, oh I see. It's a whole different use for voice matching. That's really interesting. It is really interesting. Good stuff. And then sometimes they'll slightly tweak the line, you know, so that the story of the trailer will make more sense in that shell down to 30 seconds. Yeah. So maybe they'll match together a couple of lines, or maybe you'll hear a line over the action, and it sounds like a character. And then, so what's the difference between the, the ADR and the voice magic stuff and then the, the loop group that comes in later? The actual loop groups that go into the movie, that's a whole other craft in our form. That's where, that's where when you're watching the movie, this is the analogy usually. So let's say, let's say for the sake of this conversation, there's a scene with Nicole Kidman yeah. and uh, Play store, Chris Hemmings. Yeah. 
whatever his name is. Uh -huh. The Avenger. Yes. Oh my god, we're gonna get killed by the other I just know VOP people, I don't know celebrities. Anyway, so let's say that, that in this movie, uh, it takes place in New York City in a very little bar, and let's say Nicole Kidman is supposed to be playing a spy, yep. and Chris is the innocent young CIA officer. I don't want to go over this. This is cool. <laughs> Maybe it's off to the rights for it. It's good. Okay, so they sit down at the bar, and yep. they're now going to have their first meeting. Yes, okay. In that bar scene, you will of course be seeing other patrons. Yes. You will be seeing waiters and waitresses going to the tables to take orders. You've got a bartender who probably will come up to them and say, What are you having? Or, oh, there you go. Take your time, whatever the bartender would say. Um, none of them are principals. You'll see principals meeting Chris and Nicole. The only people that were liked before the scene were Chris and Nicole. I see. Um, so they had a boom mic, they had their little uh, ear mics, they were completely mic'd up for the scene. Um, everybody else was completely unmiked. And as you already know from your on directional mic, really the only people that are styled to be clean and intact is going to be those two. Yes. Now the move, okay, so now they've shot that scene, they said they love it, it's great, Mark has a line or two, maybe he but in any case, now there's a post production. And now it's got to be a really realistic, believable, crowded, metropolitan New York City bar at night. Yep. So they literally will hire this incredible group called the Loop Group, maybe our Loop. Um, and those people, maybe they'll be 12 people deep, maybe they'll be 14 people deep, maybe they'll be, depending on the day, 8 people deep. And they'll be a certain number of guys, a certain number of gals, and they'll all be told ahead of time. Well, I'll be told ahead of time. I, I don't do it so much anymore. Since the nine hour age. Oh, wow. So, so moving nine hours? Yeah, you're, you're on sound stage for nine hours a day. Oh, yeah, you're on sound stage for nine hours a day. Eight hours and an hour of lunch. So, yeah, and then you go into overtime. Oh, no. Yeah. It's, it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, basically, the loop group will be told ahead of time. You know, you're going to be showing up Thursday, Friday. Seems you're doing take place in New York City and build up the yeah. Now it's up to the loop group people, and this is why they're they're loopers, this is why they're good at it. They go do a ton of research. They will come with notebook, no, notebooks, like street names, wow. events, and they need to know the time of year and they need to know what might or might not be going on. The loop group leader will tell them ahead of time, no proper names. Don't mention current events. This the movie takes place in the eighties, or sure. these are what these are the things you can talk about. Don't bring in anything. No, you can't use a you can't use name brands. There's not a Coke can. No, you can't use a brand. You know, you can't say Pasadena Coke. You can't say Pasadena Soda. <laughs> Um, there's all these rules. It's really amazing. Um, and these people literally now will fill in, literally, shot by shot, all the background conversation that's going on. And you won't hear 95% of it. But it lends to the depth and the reality of the final scene because somewhere on a subliminal level, coming in and out will be this beautiful audio soundtrack experience. Several layers deep. We've got a group of 12 people, but it's a bar filled with eight, five people, um, plus the staff, bartenders. You're going to keep relaying that scene down several times and tracking different people. And they'll literally assign you, okay, see that, see the one standing up, and see how it looks like she puts on her coat, and then she says, I'll see you later. Kat, you go ahead and you cover that person. Uh, Andrew, you go ahead and cover the man when she stops it, and we'll literally recreate that conversation. That's what we're doing. Watching, listening, watching the lips, and the bartender. And you're just improvising based on what? You're improvising based on what's happening. When Doug Doug Stone and I talked about that, and he told me that he did a lot of moving, he told me he used to carry around a briefcase. Yeah. Full of like a mil like one section was military stuff jargon. Depending on what he was looking, yeah. military, medical, like if he's doing a medical show, you have like all the stuff. Police. I have no idea. There was so much involved. I always thought it was more like wall where you're just kind of saying whatever. Yeah. Yeah, but it, I didn't realize it was so involved. It's so, so crazy. I mean, these people, 
The conversations they're having are highly specific and intelligent. If you watch a, a, a loop group, you can't believe how specific and yes. intelligent and and it's a, it's a shame because again, ninety five percent of it you will never hear. And maybe they'll never use the, those tracks or recordings. Maybe it will be so buried under the ambient noise. Because of course, what Chris and Nicole are saying and seeing is what matters. And maybe the bartender saying, you know, we can get a chance. Yeah. So yeah, that's and then so that's, that's the main part of it. And then of course, there's the, the matching that comes in. So that, for example, and this is what I've done a lot of. Recently, um, where I'll just go in for, I'll go in for like an hour of the group's time and just be that celebrity that I got hired to match. And do the studios, when they call you for those jobs, do they know uh, Kat has this uh, resume full of like, you can match these specific celebrities, or how do they how do they know to call you for like, this act? It sounds so glamorous coming. I mean, they don't. They don't per se. I mean, there's some good group leaders that know, but I, you know, and there's there's a few celebrities that I think it's not like the movie level, but just within like the community. She's matched her high number, so we meet. But in general, oh, you do want for the party okay. audition? Yeah, of course. Oh, okay. yeah, because every movie has a different director, usually a different producer. For them, it's very important. I mean, if you're, and, and understandably so, if it's a really top movie star, you spend sure. $20 million on, sure. and you're now replacing lines of dialogue, and you couldn't get the, the celebrities are obligated to, to make best efforts to come back, at least for the first one or two sessions. I think, I think that's, I think that's in their contract. The, okay. The first, but as the movie gets shaped and edited, maybe they won't necessarily still be available. Of course, I think it's most celebrities' choice, of course, to replace their own dialogue. And I'm sure that that's a major consideration. Um, but it's, it's a very big movie, a very big deal. Who's delivering the line for that celebrity? And you, know, you want the performance to be strong, too. So. Yeah, you know, a lot okay. of and, um, sometimes you're in a small slit because they already know you've done it before, but then the director usually gets final say. What's the what's the difference in the process doing the I mean, how big is that book when you when you come in there and you have to do like every permutation that in that video game that that, that character might say? Um, what what's that session like? Like I know there's there's some stuff with the saying now contracting, but I'm just curious, like, how is that process, and how exhausting is that process, because it feels like it's really exhausting. Yes, when you go in for a video game session, you can get 100 pages, you know, and they'll say, we need to get through 100 pages in four hours, and um, the pages are, are literally stacked with little lines, little lines, little ruler lines, of um, some description of what the, act, what the action is, what the line is, and then finally the emotion of the content to to give some content. And you're just rolling through as quickly and efficiently as you can. Um, in, in most games, it's, it is about, it's a lot about quantity, mostly, usually, except for the cinematics. But for the actual dialogue, you're just trying to refer through it as quickly as you can. <laughs> and um, some games can feel very lovely and effortless. The dialogues very sort of natural and casual and, and fun. Ar Arkham Knight was a, yeah. was a great example of the lines were really well written. The director uh, was really great. It was Amanda Wyatt, and, um, and it was it was I want to say real world dialogues are good. I mean, it's not, it's not real world, but it's stuff that we would normally see in real life. You know, I, I had a million lines as the waitress in the diner, and it's literally lines like you want another piece of pie. Oh, you should check this out. Oh, I heard the team was back out. Of the you know, it's like stuff you can say. And that makes it very lovely and very sort of like, I got this. Sort of right. Maybe you walk in other video game sessions. Again, you don't get this ever ahead of time because they don't want you leaking it on the web, usually. And so you'll walk in and it's like a stack of pages like this. And line after line after line after line and paragraphs of line. Not just like a liner, but like a whole paragraph. And it's in a foreign language. Like, 
these these games, Elder Scrolls, yes. Guild Wars, they exist in alternate universes with name, proper names that we don't have. And um, I like to think I'm fairly adept at pulling wars off the page in real time, but sometimes you just feel like the biggest moron because it'll take you eight times to get through the line because it's literally, you know, I mean, I'm going to try and make one up and I'll fail it miserably, but, you know, for Elder Scrolls, it's like, you know, be sure you get the tubulus of the air map. Oh, we need the nebulous because then it's just like, A, I have no idea what I'm saying. B, I have no idea what I just said. And C, I have no idea if I got that right. And they, of course, they know, and you'll be on a phone patch sometimes with the producers yeah. in Baltimore, Elder Scrolls, and they know it intimately. They've been developing this game for five years. So, you know, you'll you'll do the line, you'll be like secretly be like, please let me have out that and they'll be like, Well, she got everything right but Naramet. It's Naramet, not Naramet. And Cardi is going, you sound the same to me. <laughs> okay, I get it, emphasis on the first, you know. Yeah. You go, okay, okay, I got it, I got it, I got it. And then you'll do it and you'll mess up again. <laughs> Like, I swear I do this for a living. I swear I will get this. this <laughs> uh, and then on top of that, a lot of times you've got dialects. On top of that, so if you're doing like a proper British or mid Atlantic or whatever your dialect. Same four words. Yeah, on top of the like crazy ass words. <laughs> it's, you're just like, you got it, brain. And you leave those sessions just mentally. I do. I leave those sessions. Dream. Dream, yeah. Sure. Mentally just a yeah. zombie for a little bit. I just want to talk about on camera for a second because I know that's kind of where the acting stuff kind of started, I think, for you. Is that accurate? Well, for me, the acting stuff started when I was a Todd and Paul shut me up for keeping for, up the stage. But. From a professional standpoint. Yeah, I mean, I never, I never went into acting. Um, and I think this is, this is a treat for a lot of people in my generation. Yeah. Sort of the people who are... Um, on camera wasn't what it is today. It's so weird to think about that, but for those of us who fell in love with acting, the craft of acting, like the real craft, the craft of it, as opposed to the glamorous on camera side of it, for me it was always about storytelling and the interaction that happened between two people. For me, the truly cool, orgasmically awesome part of it was getting lost in that chemistry. And then of course what the audience brings to it, their energy and their excitement. And that's something that only, you know, only makes sense to people who are beside the theater, love the theater. Sure. That doesn't, does not translate them on the for the most part. I mean really, and I hate to say it, but it's only really awesome theater that you're is either in the remote festivals like your Shakespeare and you know, Fest and you know, New Hampshire or you know, back in New York, really, yeah. where you get great, great off-off-Broadway, off-Broadway and Broadway, where you see the best of the best, where you get caught up in a spell for three hours and you're part of that emotional experience. It's something that you can't describe to someone who's never been a part of it, and it's something that's really hard to explain to young people. I sometimes, from time to time, have ended up doing on-camera coaching for celebrities in other parts, you know, sort of hip hop dancers or sports, sportscasters who are really in acting or need to learn a little bit about it. And it's hard to explain to them, you know, it's not about the camera, and it's not about what the camera's going to do that. The real acting, the way you're going to learn acting, how to really engage and how to Still, when you go into audition, nine times out of ten for the callback, it's live. It's live. It's a live theater experience. You're there in the room with the they call it going to producer. You're in the room with the producer, the directors, the writers. It's live. And to book that role, to really engage that role, they're not checking out the camera still so much. Maybe they will after the fact. They're engaged in what's going on in real life here because if the chemistry is here usually it's going to sometimes be there. So that's what I was raised loving is musical comedy. Um, listening to the Disney records when I was sure. a child in the 1978s and, and imitating and singing along with her, speaking along with you know, the Tinkerbell rings for Little Bell, you know, storytelling. So 
That, that was my introduction. Did you do a lot of theater too? Yeah, a ton. That's school, all I did. In, in, in college and in school? High school too? Science fiction. Oh yeah. I was very lucky. Um, I grew up both out here and back east. I moved back and forth a lot. Oh, okay. And so I I got a lot of Broadway as a okay. kid. That was definitely in my DNA. But um, for a couple of years or two, Beverly Hills High School, which at the time, uh, had an incredible uh, theater department and a lot of amazing Nicholas Cage, Richard Dreyfus, um, and a lot of newer generation folks here in this department came out of Beverly Hills High School. And um, they had a very intense theater department, very serious theater department. Um, he did it. They, we had festivals, annual festivals, where all the schools from all over Southern California would compete. And I, can, I was in groups. The groups were six people or six more, and you would recreate one. Dyer Van Frank. Yeah. And I was in groups with um, David Schwimmer, was a senior when I was. Oh, how funny. I was a freshman. And um, Johnny Silverman for a while was Broadway, you know, was Matthew Broadway. So, I had a really great. Having that base is so important to the theater base. Yeah, it seems like the you know, people either have a background in, in theater or stand up or music sometimes, but usually it seems to be like one of those things. Yeah. So it's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so to answer your question, yeah. like when I went into on camera, it was it was a default because I knew I, I stepped out of the, the behind the scenes career that I first wanted to do out of Berkeley. Um, did that for three years, and I was like, well, I really miss acting. But I was in LA, and the idea of going back east to start from scratch to become a theater actor, it just seemed daunting, you know, at 25. And I went into on camera really as a default, because I wanted to do acting, I wanted to give myself a shot at it, and it's what was out here. And I know that sounds weird, but I never had this feeling of I want to be on camera, I'm sure, do that. And I really thought the idea was, and this sounds weird, but the, the idea of it was to go into it, get it out of my system, join a, join a local theater co-op, and yeah. do you know, some legit acting. Yeah. See what it felt like to go on camera, but I knew I was gonna fail, I mean, I literally thought I'll fail at a miserably, because I've never wanted it, it's never been something that I was dying to do, and it's so hard to break into anyway. I'll fail in a miserable way, I'll get it out of my system, and then I'll go back to this big practical. And then, weirdly enough, I just flipped out and looked, wow. Like, instantly, like, within the first month, I booked a major Folgers commercial. Oh, really? There's this whole series of campaigns that were very good in the day. The Fed started waiting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a million Yeah. And, and I was in one of those, and I didn't know. I didn't even have a union card. I got tapped partly because of that. And I was so ignorant about on back cameras and on set culture, yeah. like so new to it, that I got yelled at the first day because someone had yelled out, get that cable out of your way. Like, it was in the bedroom seat, okay. and I'm like in the bathroom. And, it was like a major brick cable that was winding, you know. And I just instantly, from the theater, there's no divas in the theater. You right. Know, everybody pitches in, everybody does everything. So sure. I literally bent down and moved it. <laughs> and I immediately, three people, you know, descended on me and said, never. Don't touch the cable. Never <laughs> touch anything. You're the talent. Go sit over there. Wow. It was like school. Oh my gosh. I cried. I tried a few times on that game. I don't know what the hell I was doing. So fast that she was playing my mom, it was a total veteran commercial after she'd been in like 30 million commercials. Like made her living very well off of it playing moms. And you know, I remember us being in the makeup trailer during me just going, I hate this. This is miserable. I don't know camera blocking. I don't understand. The director kept saying, um, and maybe you'll agree after watching this movie, but I wasn't feminine enough. I was the daughter of home college and I was wearing a very pretty bathrobe and I wasn't feminine enough. He kept saying, you're less tomboyish. Be more fluid with your movements. And I'm like, I was like, I'm not exactly the, you know, I'm not the tomboy. Exactly. So, I don't know. Wow. What a good experience. So, 
if you had gotten it out of your system and you went and done something practical, what would that? What do you think that would have been? If what? If you if you had gotten the, the acting stuff out of your system and you decided to do something practical instead? Oh, I so, did. I mean, I oh, did. You did. What? I got the on camera. I mean, I did about. I was lucky to do about three years of on camera, and was consistently booking. And this was during the um, mid mid to late nineties. Yeah. yeah. And you've done all this sitcoms that were popular, and yeah. hours that were popular, and had some great experiences. I mean, oh my God, I got to be. I was on the very last season. One of the very last episodes of the very last season of Murder, she wrote it. Oh, yeah. That was huge. And she, I think, I hit the right spot with her because the first day on set, all I, I went up to her and said, Sweetie Todd. I saw Sweetie Todd when I was like, on Broadway with her. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, you know, she was like, I'm a next to you. Yeah. She was like so thrilled that someone's like referencing Sweetie Todd. <laughs> Um, oh, wow. So, all that stuff. And uh, unfortunately, it was right before the big cable. I mean, the cable really kicked up in the what, mid, mid 2000s. HBO and all those shows. Yeah. Yeah. Early to mid 2003, 4, 5, 6. I got out of on camera um, before that because to me there was I just wasn't the on set culture wasn't exciting to me, especially having come from from working on the production side of things and having worked on the industry. It was really hard for me to go from that crazy 24/7 snaps, inspiring, get things done, suddenly being on a set where you're like hanging out for 19 hours before they get to you. So, um, so it was really hard for me, um, especially having come, coming from the background of theater where you go on this character arc and this, this story for, you know, the three hours of the story and the audience goes along with it very quickly and it, it happens somewhat in real time. And it was very odd for me to be, just, you know, you're not doing the continuity, sometimes you're the order, um, and you sit around for 19 hours and then suddenly be your time to go up and it's supposed to be like the climatic moment of the entire you know, episode. So that was a little bit challenging for me. Also the notion that for, for television, and again this is meaning no disrespect to the brilliance um, on camera, you know, I mean, are, are you kidding me? Street, and DiCaprio, De Niro? I'm not in their league, obviously, in a million years, in a million universes. They somehow managed to have this tremendous craft of acting and sustain it over all of the craft that goes on, on, on set, where it's all about the camera. Yeah. And um, and it has to be, of course, because you're filming, so it has to be, the emphasis has to be on what's the camera picking up, what angles are we at, because emotionally the director's doing what he's supposed to do. This is not dissing on anybody doing their job, but for me as a talent, not being trained in on-camera culture, it was always very jarring for me to be in the middle of a scene and you could be anywhere in it and have them go, cut! Sure. You know, and everybody just stops. So, yeah, and it has nothing to do with you. Hardly ever did. It was always because a shadow fell across someone's face, or because the light was changing, or something ended up in the scene, or maybe the director just didn't like the angle. And it, it was an odd feeling to be at the center of attention. In theory, you're, you're, you're the one that all the focus is on, but in a strange way, you're also the least of their worries. There's so much about what's going on technically. And um, again, kudos to the incredibly, phenomenally talented, every major talent who manages to do what they do. And I'm, I'm a TV addict. I mean, I'm sorry, at the end of the night, HBO, that's my job. Anything on HBO or Stars or, you know, phenomenal. How is it getting done? On camera talent. It's not just magically happening. So they're brilliant and maintaining the performance. I suck. In be patient enough to, to deal with that. So um, after the three years of sort of looking a lot, but not feeling entirely fulfilled, and, and also being confused because I was in my late twenties, I now managed to succeed at two major Hollywood scenes and then the other um, on camera, and at twenty-nine having an existential crisis of. 
and I don't like any of it. So what am I going to do with all this training and experience? And, and I still love to I'm not very lucky because on the very last gig that I was in, one of the very last major gigs I was in was a, a sitcom for Taoyo called The Naked Truth for NBC. And um, she was dating David Jacaro. Uh -huh. uh, and we were shooting on the Seinfeld stage during the hiatus. And I remember that um, the celebrity that I was, I was playing the inappropriately too young fiance of this major producer. And he suggested to me, Maybe if I wasn't entirely satisfied with on camera, maybe I would enjoy voiceover. And again, surprisingly, he's the one I brought up in the parts and love storytelling and character voices in his animation. I was completely new to it. Didn't understand it. And this was in the later part of the 90s when animation and voiceover were still relatively hidden. Yeah. When you were yeah. your magic of letting people know what it was, yeah. most people outside of the, and I was in the industry and I didn't even know what it was. I had to go to workshops to, to learn it. So let's talk a little about animation. Um, TV is the one you're probably best known for, uh, and that was, I think, your first, your first some animation. I always find it fascinating, because if you go to e yeah. and you're there, you know, the video games, people know me. You're a bit of the video yeah, game stuff. stuff. Yeah. And if you go to D23, all they care about is my Disney stuff. <laughs> and, and it's often surprising to me how surprised people will be that I've ever done anything other than what they know me as. Like sure. They'll, they'll be, it's, very dis it's very jarring for them. Yeah. You know? Like, I still see sometimes on, you know, social media, there was a whole there was a whole argument chain going on. Electric, anybody knows Electric or Marvel Heroes? It's a big game for the Marvel Marvel franchise. Right? And I'm the voice of Electric, and there was a whole like discussion chain, passionate about who's done the best voice of Electro for the last ten years. Okay, and I was bringing up other actresses to the audience. And this is the only time I remember stumbling upon something like that. And usually I check out the second I know that it's going to be people giving their two cents. As I'm the oldest, I'm the flower, like everybody, and I don't want to read some of the things I saw. Inevitably, you're going to read that, of course. So, um, but I was reading it fascinated of what they were saying about the character. They were very passionate about what the voice should sound like. And fortunately, at least 75% of them were like, yeah, okay. but there was a whole chain. It was hilarious where someone goes, Cat Crescent is the voice of Electra? And someone else said, yeah, look it up. She's been in on the past two installations or whatever. And the person said, he's Electra? And the person said back, you know, she's also the bride of the mansion. And the person was like, they said something funny like, that just flipped my shit or whatever. You know, like to it was like, yeah, it's nuts that I would ever be anything other than what they were So I, it still surprises me because I feel like saying to them, Yes, yeah. we're in voiceover because we do like to do voices. So that was the first animation gig. Uh, I, I think there was a voice match uh, gig that you were hired for. Is that accurate? Well, originally, because it had been a pilot. Yes. And so the girl who had done it, it was a thesis project, actually, at Alex, which is astonishing. Uh, yeah. Yes, it was his thesis project, graduating from CalArts. So the girl who was, you know, okay. student in college, um, with Cartoon Network, which was pretty much brand new, they were, they were in cahoots with Hannah Barbera, and um, they basically, they just had, like it had just aired, and now they wanted to do three episodes of and so that's, they needed to find someone now to take over the voice for the actual show. Okay. So yeah, started out. Started out initially. Here's what she sounds like. The pilot. Here's what we're going to sound. It very quickly. I mean, Genji took it into another direction. 
So the first time working in that genre, what was it like working in that room with, with so many other really people that are so seasoned in that, in that art? Uh, what was that like being in that room? Yeah, I mean, that was bananas. Because it doesn't usually go down that way. Most most series do not record the entire cast in the room, yes. Um, and particularly if so much of the dialogue is on just two characters. But Gendy, this was his first major gig, and, and he had sort of this vision for how he wanted it. He really wanted everybody there. And um, I, I look back and I'm astonished that some of those people were okay just sort of like chilling on stools <laughs> for two hours waiting for their lines to wrap. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I was really legends. Legends. I mean, they're so legends. I, I literally just kind of fallen backwards into voiceover and was still learning mic technique and still didn't understand what being off axis meant and how to play with the mic and its levels and something I'm going to work with Jeff Bennett, Ron Paulson, Frank Welker, Tom Kenny, who, who wasn't Spongebob yet, right, right, right. <laughs> um, Chris Cavanaugh and Matt Suisei and an occasional other walk-in people and it was, it was mind-blowing. I mean, and I didn't know enough to know how extraordinary these people were because I was still very new to voiceover. Sure. I certainly knew some of their characters or, or someone had told me, you know, um, they were for the most part, you know, so gracious and oh my God, so patient with me because I was really learning it, you know, along with Gendy on the other side of the house when those were on our first major assignment and I um, feel really fortunate. Do you have any Christine Cavanaugh stories uh, when you were recording that you could share? She's amazing. I mean, yeah. she was she was so egoless. She didn't have you know, a lot of actors, rightfully so. When I was getting into it, had a sense of you should know who I am because of what I've done. You know, that's that's sure. sort of what they carried with them, and she had none of that. Hmm. And in fact, we she did. would get it. Oh, the car. Like, we do. We did not. Uh, about what she did. She wasn't about that. <laughs> I remember she, she drove a yeah, very modest car, that, right? which yeah. put me yeah. in peace immediately. Yeah. Because <laughs> I was still like in my yeah. little starter. And she was very sweet. And she would explain to she, In between takes, she was explaining to me what certain things meant. And then she invited me out for like, went out for a bottle of wine or something, just after maybe a couple of weeks of episodes, just, just, to, just to talk, just to, I think, relax me, relax the kid's sister who didn't know what meant. <laughs> the microphone. Yeah. And we didn't really talk about voiceover. In fact, I remember being astonished when we went back to her house. She had a really cool, funky, awesome Hollywood Hills house that she was living in. And I remember seeing the artwork and it was probably the first time I knew she'd been a rug rat or a yeah. rat, and they, she didn't talk about that at all. And I remember being like, oh, oh my God. She was like, yeah. oh. And people wow. would then tribute art and fan art and yeah. a wall of that. Oh, that's so awesome. And I was just smitten. I couldn't believe how modest and awesome she was. I can't say that. She was Amazing. so kind to me. So kind to me. Uh, on Facebook, we actually got a question. Uh, Tori yeah. David wanted to know: uh, Was there a difference in recording when it was Kristen Bell yeah. versus when after she left the show and and Andy Milo took over? Well, when that happened, that was several seasons in. Yeah. I mean, I think at least and I, I could be wrong on the seasons because again, it was like over three hundred episodes. Yeah. Like I don't. I lose track a little bit, but. Um, Gendy, Gendy, of course, moved on to a lot of other greater things looking after that. So he was um, off of it at that point as, as the main showrunner. I'm sure he was still involved. But he wasn't the main director. Now we had um, Colette Sunderman yeah. you know, taking over. And um, a lot of the voice directing. And, um, you know, of course, of course there was a, you know, it was a different human being. She was doing the voice match, so I'm sure she was also sometimes occasionally being reminded of or having to figure out how to deliver that. Um, we weren't doing it 
with everybody in the room at the same time always anymore. Sometimes yes, but you really split up at least, or at least after we're off taking breaks or returning calls or doing other things and sitting in the room. It was in a different location. And yeah, the whole energy was different. And by then, not that I was a, by any shot a seasoned veteran, I still don't think, you know, I'm still not close to being that. But um, at least I had done some other gigs by then, so I was saying what I was doing somewhat. Okay, still needed to be reminded and directed and all that. And and Dee's always a voice that um, takes a second to get back into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there anything you're working on now that you can talk about uh, that, that's coming up? Or it's I know that's the thing. It's, it's you can. I know most of you can. Probably. It's very weird too, because in the on-camera world, they want people to try getting people excited, but in voiceover work, it so I'm ongoing in Guild Wars and uh, I'll be a voice in the next DLC, the next something exciting to be released, an update, an upgrade, a new adventure that's going to be coming out and that's very exciting. Um, uh, just recorded more Marvel Heroes, Marvel Universe, which I think just came out. I think someone was tweeting at me that sounded great and it was like an all new. So I think that is really um, Master Brian doesn't come out until around April. Summer, that's very exciting. Um, a lead. There's seven races on races. And uh, there's the NASA project that I did that I was lucky enough to get pulled into between Fusion and Disney has something to do with the background in NASA because that's a virtual reality project. It's, uh, its first mission is out there being previewed at various festivals. Um, I think that goes wide and goes broader probably in the next year or so. And I'm, like I said, I'm a voice in looking glass and all that to share with. That's exciting. Okay. <laughs> um, ongoing ESPN. Yeah. Um, yeah, we can talk about ESPN, yeah. Live not before. tonight. Ooh, not tonight, but in the next part two. <laughs> part two. <laughs> uh, yeah, very lucky to see you. Well, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. So, so. Thanks, everybody. See you next time.